to give a Dhamma talk on one of my favorite suttas. This is called the Kosambians. Uh, Kosambi was a place where there was a lot of different spiritual uh, teachers. And they kept getting a lot of mixed messages. And they were very confused, so they asked the Buddha to do that. And he did, he went to Kosambi, he was going to spend the rains retreat there. But there was an incident where there was one monastery was spreading rumors about another monastery and they got pretty much divided and they were always quarreling with each other. So that's kind of the background of what uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Kosambi in Gosita's Park. Now on that occasion the monks of Kosambi had taken to quarreling and brawling. It basically they were gossiping a lot and were in deep dispute, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. They can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others. They could neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Then a certain monk went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and informed him of what was happening. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus. A monk, tell those monks that in my name the teacher calls them. Yes, venerable sir. Is that better? Can, can you hear me better now? Okay. Yes, venerable sir, he replied. And he went to those monks and told them, the teacher calls you venerable ones. Yes, friend, they replied. They went to the blessed one after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The blessed one asked them, monks, is it true that you have taken to quarreling and brawling and are in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you could neither be persuade, or you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, what do you think when you take to quarreling and brawling and are in deep dispute, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? that you on that occasion maintain acts of loving kindness in body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life. No, venerable sir. So monks, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are in deep dispute, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, on that occasion you do not maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions. Okay, that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Misguided men, that is a big slap. That will lead you to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, 
There are these six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. What are the six? Here a monk maintains bodily acts of loving kindness in public and private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality which creates love and respect and conduces to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. Again, a monk maintains verbal acts of loving kindness in public and private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that conduces to love and respect and conduces to unity. Again, a monk maintains mental acts of loving kindness both in public and private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that conduces to love and respect and conduces to unity. Now, if I was giving this Dhamma talk, I would have changed the order and started out with uh, mental acts. Why? Because Mind is a forerunner of all states. And if you're not doing it in your mind, you're not going to do it with your body or with your speech. So this is a set formula. It's that way all the way through the, the uh, suttas. But I wish it was in a different order. That's my personal opinion. Again, a monk uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life without making reservations. He shares with them any gain of any kind that accords with the Dhamma and has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the contents of his bowl. Now, uh, when I was going out on arms around in, in uh, Burma, a monk that was practicing a special kind of discipline. It's called a Dutanga discipline, where he would not take anything that was not offered into his bowl. He only ate what was offered. And I would go out on alms round and I always got a lot of food. Um, I think mostly because I was a tall Westerner and I had red hair, which was really kind of strange at that time. Anyway, as I was eating from my bowl, I saw a kind of food that the monk liked. So I would put that into his bowl. Whether I liked it or not didn't matter. I just, I like giving. That's, that's one of the things that I do a lot. I give away a lot of different kinds of things. Anyway, we always, everybody knew the kinds of food that he, would like, that he would like, so that if they got any of that, they would do that. Now, where I was going out on alms round, because they thought I was something very special, they sometimes would give food, and they only had enough food for themselves for the day. And they would put all of that food into my bowl. So at the end of the the meal, I took that food out, I put it on a tray, and I went back and I gave it back. 
uh, I couldn't see not eating that food. But there is a rule for monks that says when you get done with your bowl, you're supposed to empty it, empty the food out and throw it on the ground. And I couldn't do that. So when I started going back to the village and it was a, a mile, mile and a half walk, it wasn't very far. So when I took all that food back, I got criticized very, very heavily that I was breaking a rule that shouldn't be broken. But it just didn't make sense to me that I had, I had enough food for four or five monks. And these people were giving me food that they only had for the day. How could I not give it, give it back to them? They already made a lot of merit because they gave the food to us, to me and the other monks. So it's not taking anything from them. It's just giving back. That's what I did daily, and I got criticized daily for doing it. I, I was told in no uncertain terms that I'm going to have to leave that monastery if I don't stop doing that, which I did after a couple of weeks. I couldn't take it anymore. But there was another thing that happened. They knew that there was a, a treat uh, that it's uh, fermented tea leaves and it has nuts and garlic and, and sesame seed and things like that. And they would give that and I would eat it. But the monks that came to visit, what they did was they would wait until I was done eating and put my bowl aside. And then they would offer that food to me. Now, I would take it, but I wasn't going to eat it. So I just put it with the other food so that the other, other people could have a, a treat. But they were testing me to see whether I was really like that or not. And, okay, you can test me all you want. That's that's fine. I don't I don't have any problem with that. So there are certain dutanga practices that I practiced for a period of time. One of the dutanga practices is only using three postures. Now there's four postures that we all use standing, sitting, walking, lying down. So I didn't lie down. I did that for a number of months. And uh, you wind up not sleeping so much and you wind up getting more energy and that sort of thing. But it, it is a very difficult practice. There's uh, three levels of doing it. One is sitting in the middle of the floor while you're sleeping. And when you do that, you only sleep for 10 or 15 minutes at a time. And you wind up with back aches. Um, I saw a lot of monks that were trying to do that in Thailand. And they would just go all the way down, put their head on the floor and go to sleep. And they all wound up with bad backs. The next kind is leaning against the wall. And I found if I leaned in a corner that it supported my body better so I could do that. And the last kind is sitting in a chair without any arms. So it's a, an interesting kind of discipline that we that we practice. So some of the practices 
laymen cannot do. It's uh, a practice of never entering a building. It's a practice of sitting out under a tree. Or it's a practice of sitting out in the open. Now, if you sit out in the open, you had to take your robes and make a little tent so you could get out of the, the direct sun. So it's a, a, a hard practice, especially during the range retreat where it does rain a lot. So it, it's a hard practice and not one that I wanted to do. But there's other things of uh, only using three robes or uh, only wearing uh, rag robes. Rag robes are pieces of cloth. They mostly came from charnel ground. Then they were wrapped around bodies. And after a period of time, the body rots. And then you can take that cloth and dye it and turn it into a robe. But I didn't see any real advantage of doing that. Of course, there are reasons for doing all of this. It's the lack of attachment and that sort of thing. But it's to a very... An interesting thing with a bowl or with a robe that gets uh, torn. If the tear is over one inch, then the only time you can repair the robe is before you go on an alms round. In other words, you got to get up at four o'clock in the morning and sew your robe and repair it and put a patch on it if it needs a patch, whatever. And that's a difficult practice. So there's all kinds of different things that monks do that, that laymen really, you're not suited to do. So, and I have met monks that, that do all of those things. They only live in the forest. Um, one monk, he was a very famous monk in Burma. He had super strong loving kindness. And when I went to visit him, he uh, was doing something with his back turn. As soon as I walked into the room, he turned around and smiled at me and rated me, radiated some very, very strong loving kindness. Of course, I gave it back to him and radiated loving kindness to him. But he was a monk that could sit in front of a, a bowl of water and he, he would chant and it was like the water was on a hot plate and it started rolling, bubbling. And of course, anybody, anytime somebody did that when he was in the room doing that, they would get some of that water for themselves. And it, it was real interesting being around him, but unfortunately he only spoke Burmese. So I had to go through a translator and I never know what the translator is saying. So I have no idea if what I said came across to him, but he seemed to smile a lot. And we laughed and he had a, a nice kind of laugh. And it was, it was great. It was good fun. And it so happens that he uh, gave me a set of robes, 
which was all good and well, but the ropes were big enough for a Samanera that's nine years old. They're really small, and I couldn't wear it, so I gave it to someone else. Anyway, that's a way that we we get things according to Dhamma. That's donated in a particular way, and we chant over it and that sort of thing. And then we uh, share the merit of doing that with them. And that's done in accordance with. Okay. Again, a monk dwells both in public and private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life those virtues that are unbroken, unformed, unblotched, unmuddled, liberating, commended by the wise, not, not misapprehended, and conducive to collectedness. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about keeping the precepts. This, uh, an awful lot of people have, especially in the West, have this idea, the only time you really have to be careful with the when you're doing a retreat. And quite often, if you're doing a retreat, they only give you the precepts one time and they don't talk about it. And this is kind of a mistake because the precepts need to be followed as closely as possible with your daily activities, whatever you're doing. When you break a precept and then you try to sit in meditation, what happens? You are going to have a hindrance arise. That's why hindrances arise because we've broken precepts in the past and it can carry over from one, one lifetime to the next. So you never know exactly which precept you broke to cause that to happen. But it does happen this way. And it's real important that you understand deeply uh, that you need to keep your precepts. The whole reason you're doing the meditation is so you can purify your mind so your mind can become more wholesome and uplifted. So breaking of precepts means that's going to be a hindrance to you so that you can't have that happen. So there's definite benefits. Now, when you keep your precepts for a period of time, a year, two years, five years, whatever, then you'll notice that magical things start to happen. You'll, you'll be much more sharp with your mindfulness. You'll be able to see how mind moves from one thing to another much more quickly and you can let it go and use the six R's and that will help you in your everyday life and life starts to get very magical. You start to think about, well, you know, I really need this or that. I need to look at this book or that book. And all of a sudden it's there. It's really kind of fun when, when you keep your precepts. And of course it keeps your mind sharper and more alive. You're not living in a dream world anymore where you're caught up in your wants and desires and your dislikes and your frustrations and your anxiety. And the classic word right now is stress. I don't feel any stress. Why would I want stress? 
Why would I worry about whether something is going to happen or not? Either it's going to happen or it's not. It's out of my control. So why would I need to have this stress, this dissatisfaction, this frustration, this fear, this anxiety? So you see, when you keep your precepts without breaking them, it turns into a protection for you. And that's wonderful. So the more you practice that, the easier life becomes. Again, monk. A monk dwells in public and in private, possessed in common with his companions in the holy life, that view that is noble and emancipating, and leads one who practices it in accordance with the complete destruction of suffering. Oh, what's that talking about? Sounds, sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? It's talking about being able to share your experience with other people. The idea of not talking about what, where your practice is with other people is actually harmful to you. And you don't have a, a deep feeling of, uh, commitment, you don't have a deep feeling of sangha. You don't have any kalyamitas that you can talk to if a problem comes up and you don't know how to solve it. But I try to teach everyone that when you keep your intuition going and you pay attention to your intuition and you follow your intuition, it will give you all the answers you need if there's a major problem that you're going through. So this too is a memorable quality. All of these are, all six of these are memorable qualities. And the way you, it, you get to show other people what these qualities can do is by your own practice. You be the, the giver of confidence. And the more confidence you have in that this is the way it works, the more confidence comes back to you. So many people have this idea that being a teacher means being uh, somebody that's the boss. That's the guru. You have to follow what I say. And I spend a lot of time in each retreat trying to tell people, you're your own teacher. Follow your own intuition. Believe it and follow it. The less you believe it and follow it, the less it comes up. And it's a quiet little voice. So it's a real important thing for you to understand that when the intuition you're driving along and, and your intuition says, stop, you need to go into this store, do it. Because there's going to be something there that you need to hear or do or help in whatever way. And that makes life a lot more fun. These are the six memorable qualities that create love and respect, conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. Of these six memorable qualities, the highest and most comprehensive, the most conclusive, is with this view 
that is noble, emancipating, and leads one who practices in accordance with the complete destruction of suffering. We just had a student of mine stay with me for a little while, and he was an anagami. So being around him, he was a great example of keeping his precepts. He wouldn't even think about breaking a precept. And uh, right, he just left to go, go to Europe. And one of the last things I said to him was, I thank you for coming so we could laugh together. And we did. We were always giggling and laughing about something. We hear, hear uh, somebody else say the Dhamma, that, that great, that, that made me laugh. And, and I, I also, I, I told him that the longer I'm on this path, the more joy I have, and it doesn't go away. I have a lot of joyful feelings coming up spontaneously by themselves. And I don't have a lot of fear and anxiety and, and boredom and uh, depression. I don't have any of that kind of stuff coming up. Why? Because I have so much joy. And that was one of the things that I practiced in, in Burma. And whenever joy would come up, they would say, don't get attached. Well, I didn't want to be attached to anything, so I was pushing it away. Wrong. How dumb is that? I was just blindly following because I didn't know. But all of you are, you're smart people. You're very intelligent, especially intelligent in Dhamma, and that makes me happy. You have no idea how happy that makes me. So, be the example, and then watch what happens with other people around you. How they start to change, because they're using you as kind of like a parent. You know, all the parents, their, their example of their actions and their words to all their kids. So when you have good actions and good words, you're teaching other people. You have to let them do what they're going to do. You can't talk people out of doing bad things. Because they'll say, yeah, 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 I'll do it. But they're not gonna. So you be the example and show them how to be kind to other people. Oh, I used to go into Walmart occasionally and there would be a sh short lady and she'd want something on the top shelf. So I'd, I'd reach up and give it to her. And, oh, they, that really made them happy. They didn't have to trouble anybody else. They didn't have to go away and uh, try to get other people that were taller to help. I just saw the need and did it. And that helped my joy. That helped her joy. And our deep inside happiness. That's what meditation is for. It's not for the attainment of this or that. It's for living life in a happy, helpful way. Help other people become less. And it's fun. So, just as the highest, most comprehensive, the most comprehensive, uh, con conclusive part 
of a pinnacle building is the pinnacle itself. So two of these six memorable qualities, the highest is the view that is noble and emancipating. See why I like this, this sutta? And how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead one who practices in accordance with the complete destruction of suffering? Interesting question. Here, gone to the forest or the root of a tree or an empty hut, considers thus, is there any obsession unabandoned by myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are? Think about your worry, your anxiety. That's an obsession, isn't it? Do you think about things as they actually are or are you clouded with anxieties and th taking things personally? If a monk is obsessed with sensual lust, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed with ill will, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed with sloth and torpor, then his mind is obsessed. If he's obsessed with restlessness and anxiety, then his mind is obsessed. If he's obsessed with doubt, then his mind is obsessed. If a monk is absorbed in speculation about this world, where do we come from? Why are we here? Those kind of questions. Then his mind is obsessed. If a monk is absorbed in speculation about other worlds, then his mind is obsessed. What's going to happen to me when I die? Where am I? What am I going to be reborn? All of these kinds of questions. If a monk takes to quarreling and brawling and is in deep dispute, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, then his mind is obsessed. He understands thus, there is no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. My mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. This is the first knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. What does super mundane mean? Super mundane means that you have experienced a jhana, that you keep your precepts without breaking them, that you experience Nibbana. It's all of those different things. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I pursue, develop and cultivate this view? Do I personally obtain serenity? personally abstain quenching. Well, again, it's talking about being in the jhanas. You have a mind that's very peaceful, very calm, that has equanimity in it. And there's no hindrances that arise while you are in the jhana. Now, if a jhana seems to come up, why does it come up? Because your mind is weak for whatever reason. You just kind of lose interest a little bit and then a hindrance arises. You're not in the jhana at that time. But when you use the six R's and get back into that jhana, then you're in that super mundane state. And ordinary people 
they don't know about this. They're walking around asleep for the most part. They're caught up in their personal beliefs in a, in a, a self. I'm bored, I'm this, I'm that. And they're caught up in that. But as you go along the path, one of the things that you'll notice is that your sense of humor starts to change. And as, instead of having really loud belly laughs, you have kind of a chuckle. And this, this chuckle, the quality of chuckle, I can tell what state you are in just by your laugh. And quite often, one of the things that I'll ask is, what's your mind doing right now? And if they go through hindrances that are very difficult, what have you learned from this? It's an important question. He understands that when I pursue, develop and cultivate this view, I personally obtain serenity. I personally obtain quenching. This is the second knowledge attained by that person that, that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Excuse me, I'm getting hiccups. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation, possessed of a such as, the, as I possess. Oh, I've been doing meditation for 45 years. I've done a lot of different kinds of meditation and I've never found a view like this. So it's real interesting. They might talk about it. They might talk about, uh, especially the Brahmins, they'll, they'll talk about not-self in a lot of different ways, but not like this. Why is that? Because they haven't learned what craving is and how to let it go. He, understood, he understands thus, there's no other recluse or Brahmin outside of the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess. This is the third knowledge attained by them that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. How could they? they're not educated. One of the things I tell all my students when they come for retreat is you're going to be a lot smarter in 10 days than you believe possible. You're not going to believe how smart you are because you are teaching yourself. You're solving your own problems. And you're having personality development. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? I don't call it right view, I call it harmonious perspective, which means the impersonal nature of everything. What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although they may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down. Now I'm going to let this, let that be for a moment. What are we talking about? Breaking a precept. 
You break a precept, and what happens? The first thing is this wrong belief in a personal self arises. I shouldn't have done that. That's what's really quietly in your mind. And that's where all of the hindrances come from. They come from breaking a precept and then taking it personally and then feeling guilty about doing that. Say stealing. It's a weird phenomenon, stealing. Because things that are stolen, they don't last very long. If they steal money, money just disappears. I read a story about all the pirates. And then at night, it would all disappear. Wow. So they always like the pirates to come and, and go into the, uh, drink some alcohol and get a little bit rowdy. And then they wind up getting rid of all of the things that they stole. So they got no real advantage from doing that. Okay, now, after you break a precept, you're gonna feel guilty. <coughs> and sometimes you might not even break a precept, but you think you did, and you feel guilty. Now, if that happens, then what I want you to do, if there's nobody around that you can tell about this, is forgive yourself for making a mistake. Take the precepts again. You only have five precepts. I have 227. So you see there's a big difference here. But after you take the precept, you make a very strong determination. I'm not going to do that to myself again. No more. And I've... I've told this story a few times. Somebody came up to me in, in Malaysia and they said, okay, okay, okay. I want to be wealthy. How do I get to be wealthy? And I said, the first thing you got to do is you have to give. And the second thing you have to do is keep your precepts without breaking them. And he finally said, okay, I'll do that. How long do I have to keep the precepts? And I said, well, you can start it a hundred years from now and, and go longer as time goes by. So that gives you an idea how it's not, this is an active kind of meditation. Too many people think that meditation is only about sitting and it's not. It's about living. That's why I wrote the book, Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life. There's no difference between the two. It's still watching how your mind works. That's the key. Okay? Just as a young tender infant lying prone at once draws back when he puts his hand or his foot on a live hot coal, so too that is a character of a person who possesses right view. He understands thus, I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fourth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. 
Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may be active in various matters for his companions in the holy life, yet he has a keen regard for training and higher virtue. In Pali, higher virtue is called Abhidhamma. It's not the same as the Burmese teach Abhidhamma. Those are books that are made up after the Buddha died. They didn't come into being strongly until about the fourth Buddhist council, but the third Buddhist council, they started uh, paying more attention to the Abhidhamma than they did any kind of practice or any kind of study. Training in the higher mind and training in the higher wisdom, just as a cow with a new calf. While she grazes, she watches her calf. So too, that is a character of a person who possesses right view. Now the next two things are the things that I really, really like. Uh, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he heeds it, gives it full attention. This is called giving ear. He engages it with all his mind. He hears the Dhamma with eager ears. That's one of the things that makes this fun. Because you, see, you, you can hear the same sutta over and over and over again. And you can learn something new. You get an aha moment that, oh, that's what that's talking about. When I was talking with Delson about this, the man that's an anagami, he, uh, what? <laughs> oh, you made me forget what I was going to say. he would listen to a Dhamma talk that I was giving. And the whole time he had a smile on his face and he was going like this. Every, every time I made a point, it was like, yeah. And it's like he was listening to it for the first time. And I know he's heard these suttas many times before but he kept on hearing it at a different level. That's one of the magical things about Buddhism, is you hear it at this level, and then a little while later, you hear it at another level, and you go, oh, yeah, that's right. And it gets real exciting, and it gets real fun. So I want to encourage you to read good Dhamma books as much as possible. He understands us. I possess the strength of a person who has right view. This is the sixth knowledge attained by that person that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a 
person who possesses right view. This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he gains inspiration in the meaning. And that can happen many times with the same sutta. Gains inspiration in the Dhamma. Gains gladness in the Dhamma. That is connected with the Dhamma. And that happens to me all the time. I hear a good Dhamma talk. It makes me smile. It, it, it brings my mind uplifted and happy because I'm hearing it in a different way. A lot of times when I'm giving the sutta and I'm reading it to you, I'm not hearing it as deeply as I could. That's just the, that because it's different places in the mind that are getting used for saying it out loud. But when I hear it, I get real, a lot of gladness and happiness. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he has well, he has well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. Now I know there's been some debate whether listening to a Dhamma talk you can attain Nibbana. doesn't happen often, but it can happen to anyone. I have one student in particular that many years ago, I was reading to her about dependent origination and she really liked dependent origination and she really paid close attention to what I was saying. And she attained Nibbana right then. It's wonderful. It's amazing. And ever since then, she has become a teacher and she's in India now. The only thing that really interests her is dependent origination and different ways of being able to uh, teach it. She's always trying to come up with a different way so everybody will understand it. It's wonderful. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he possesses the fruit of stream entry. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So now you know why I like this sutta. It gives you a lot of information. It's not as deep as some, some suttas go, but it is quite good and it's quite interesting. So, now the question that causes everybody to get very silent. Do you have any questions? Bhante. Oh, yes. How are you, Bhante? It's been long, I'm long great. time. Yeah. It's going to get more regular and I am going to be giving online retreats for 10 days. That's good. Where I talk to you every day. So, Bante, I, continue. I want to sh uh, share some uh, gratitude to you. Uh, because uh, I made, uh, we are, uh, I, we are, have, we have a group of film friends. And we are having weekly sutta sessions, just good. four to five people. And we are having good Dhamma discussions. 
and every in every discussion we remember you and we are so grateful to you so on on behalf of all of our group members i am saying thank you a big thank you bante well, sadhu to you too <laughs> i would i really truly wish you all the happiness I wish you the joy that I experience all the time. Thank you, Bante. Uh, we are so grateful for you, Bante, for sharing film with us, and it changed our life. I can say. Oh, that makes me really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any question or comment that they don't understand? Uh, Bante, I have a question about uh, intuition, and I, yeah. as I, so you uh, explain it like you ask a question, and as I understand, if you're really silent, you can you can get a pretty good answer. Um, yeah. Is there is there more to it to like um, maybe some good tips or tricks or is that really the best you can uh, that's, that's, go with? That's by far the best. Okay. <laughs> Now you're not always going to get answers that you particularly like. It can be answers that you don't <laughs> like, but follow your follow what the intuition says, and you will. it greatly when he didn't have a teacher around he had to follow his own intuition right Thank and you. with some of the um, exploring that we've been doing we figured out what it's like to be an arahat An arahat has no craving at all, but they have all five aggregates. So they walk around; they have no distraction in their mind, but they're very aware of everything around them. And they have loving kindness coming out of them very strongly. So. You look like you have another question. <laughs> I, I I was wondering what what is intuition? What were is It's that? It's a quiet voice that is always right. <laughs> Am I going to be able to figure that one out um, by intuition? Yeah, you will. <laughs> You'll ask a question. It doesn't always come in at the speed you want it to. Sometimes it takes a little while, but it's definitely worthwhile. Thank you. You'll see, and the more you pay attention to it, the the better it gets. Okay, Michael. Hi, Bente. Michael is next. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You have to unmute. You just, uh, uh, yeah, but you just took it off the uh, the video. Okay. Hello. Uh, Hello. Ah, now I can hear you. Thank you, Bonte. Great to be with you. Ah, I was wondering, Bonte, if you could kindly uh, expand upon the uh, the seven. What was it? The seven factors. Right. I've expanded as much as I know how. <laughs> It was cited David in the uh, sutta today. Is making a 
copy of this. He's going to put it on YouTube so you can go over it again if you want. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Super. Okay. Hello. Savan Kumara? Yeah. Hi, Vante. I'm Savan Kumar's wife. Hello. Hello. Can you Happy hear me? to see you again. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you, Bante. Can you hear me? Barely. If you speak up a little bit louder, it would be easier. Yeah. Uh, we are so there. thankful for you, Bante. <laughs> yeah, I have a silly question like how to become an intelligent <laughs> how to become intelligent yeah by pay attention very closely to the dhamma talks you get more intelligent all the time because you are teaching yourself from direct experience okay as i am searching for a job so that's why <laughs> I'm asking this question. Patience leads to Nibbana. <laughs> okay? Okay. Okay, Dante. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other question? Okay, then let's share some merit. The merit is right behind me. Right, right, whoops. Hey, well, Bonte? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, how are you? Uh, I thought you were asking her if she had another question. May I ask one quick question? Of course. Okay, it's good to see you again. It's been a oh, while. Thank you, it's good to see you too. Um, is it, um, so, in the last month, um, during my sits, I've had the hindrances uh, arising quite a lot. And I'm wondering, uh, when is it appropriate to switch to forgiveness meditation? Um, when you feel like you need it. Just when you feel like, okay, when you feel like you need it, yeah. Um, but does that help with, with the hindrances? Because I'm breaking precepts, obviously, or have in the past. It's certainly... Yeah, it, it certainly can. Yes, yeah. of course. Okay. That's, the that's... thing is that I want you to I want you to be careful of is don't get involved in the story of why you broke a precept in the past. The most important thing is staying with the forgiveness and forgive your mind for any distraction or any any hindrance at all. Just forgive it for being there and come back. And some experience in the past will come up. And then you spend your time forgiving that person or people. Until you feel relief. And this, this is a real relief. It's like somebody took a hundred pounds of rocks off your shoulders and you almost feel like flying. Okay? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Bhante. And if you have any problem, let us know and we'll try to help you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Hello. Quick question. It says, hi, Bhante. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> This this is this is maybe a silly question related to the precepts. So I, I like to play board games sometimes, but like in some of these board games, you kind of have to lie, so to speak, because you're pretending to be something. Is that better not to do, or it's it's... Not, that's no? Everybody knows that you're doing that. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, yeah, I. So that's that's not a re that you're not you're not to deceive the world. Well, you don't know that, what kind of game that they. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for answering that. How was how was your trip? Oh, it was great. Yeah, it was how really was great. Trip? Yeah, it was it was very good. Very easy. 
The only yeah. challenging part was I had to travel with this man, and then he lost his phone, and oh, it's just all drama. <laughs> oh, that's really tough. Yeah. But no, I, I had a really great time. Thank you so much. So how's Marco doing? Oh, he's doing really well. He's doing really well. He's, he's playing outside right now. We, we, we played the whole morning because I, <laughs> due to the time difference, I was up really early. So Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Be happy. <laughs> I'll do my thing. Yes. Is, is there any other question? No. Okay. Bonte, this is, this is Bo. I, I just want to say it's a, such a delight to see you. I haven't seen you in so long, so I just didn't want you to get away to, just to say thank you and thank you, David. And yeah, it's just really warmed my heart so much. And uh, thank you so much. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. I do to you too. Okay, let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fearless fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you for coming, everybody. We'll see you next week. Same time, same channel.